you're here with us in Doha. Thank you. Thank um, you. But you're no uh, no stranger to the region, and one of those people who spend an awful lot of time in region in, and in country and in neighbourhood. If we bring it down to that level, mm -hmm. uh, one of the areas that uh, you've been spending a lot of time in is Yemen. That's right. Um, the aim of this conference is to really sort of share best practice from academics, policymakers, experts, um, to see where they can sort of apply those learnings in other places. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the sort of learnings and insights that you've garnered from being down and dirty in market and seeing real issues, what are the sort of things that you'd like to, to share with the community and, and people can learn from this experience? I think one of the greatest lessons has been that action needs to be heavily localized and it needs to be based on the kinds of data that you gather at a very strict local level. It's not just one size fits all or transferable from one location to the next. And also that it must be bottom up and not top down. That is what Al-Qaeda does. It works with grassroots, works in communities. Uh, actually, 56% of all of its governance tweets in Yemen were about community development projects. So getting into that space, filling that vacuum that's left by the state would be a massive boon to preventing communities getting on side with these guys, not necessarily joining them, but tolerating them in the first place. So that phrase of fill the vacuum, and then obviously places where jihadist and terrorist organizations can take places where there is a vacuum. That's right. So first identify the conditions that create vacuums, yes. and then to try and address them, fill the vacuum. And also fill the vacuum before they get there. So what often happens is that uh, governments or aid agencies through governments actually wait for something to happen before they address it. But the whole secret is to try to get there before the Mujahideen get there. Uh, that's actually quite difficult to measure. Everyone wants to measure everything these days. If there wasn't anyone there and we've done something and now there's still no one there. So that's actually success, but you yeah. can't measure it in, yeah. a, in a very logical way. Well, I think you, there, there are two things there. One is, you know, this sort of almost headlong pursuit of metrics, and then sometimes mm -hmm. there can be misguided ones, and fully, fully agree there. I think the other one is this issue of making sure that there's a, a relevance to the action, and it's relevant to the local community. Um, education, that's mm -hmm. a really good example where there are top-down initiatives with multi-million dollar investments in big locations and maybe building white elephants. Mm. Uh, what, what's your view on that as an example of top-down and, uh, and bottom-up? Well, I feel there can be a lot of waste. For example, there have been many, many schools built in the eastern region of Yemen, where I work. Many of them are now dilapidated, windows broken, they're full of goats and sheep. Why? It's not because kids don't want an education or their parents don't want them to be educated. It's that what really needs to be addressed is the curriculum. What are they learning? Do they actually see any use in it? Because if they do, they'll go to school. And who's going to teach them? It's very easy to throw up a building. It's much more difficult to train teachers to get them to go to these remote places and to provide the kinds of classes that local tribes will find useful and interesting and think will lead somewhere. And that's another question entirely, leading somewhere. There has to be a meritocracy at some point. So you have to think that your education will get you somewhere. So within the education, it's not just the building, it's the role in the community, it's the curriculum, and it's also the teaching staff. It is, and actually I'm trying to help with a program uh, dreamt up by locals in the east of Yemen, and I helped them get a hold of a program called Enawanahlu, Me and Us, Peace Building Stability program to teach. Avoiding the, creating a vacuum. Well, right. Creating and vacuum. also, the last thing we need money for is to build schools. We just use existing places, tents, halls, wherever kids can gather and be taught, because it's, the infrastructure is not the important mm. thing. It's the thing that looks good in the glossy magazines of the governments back home. Yeah. So we've got to find the right content, the right people to convey, the right curriculum in the audiences in a local level, because education is that first step. Yes. And then that also has to lead to a job and employment. And yes. so we've also got to make sure that when we come through, and as Faisal was saying, that making sure that there are those those jobs and opportunities to move into when people are educated. Yes, Faisal, I think, was spot on with that. There have to be the jobs there, but they have to be given out on a meritocratic basis and not according to whom you know, how well connected you are, so that there's actually point to trying to be well educated and not just 
nurturing contact. It, it has to be, uh, but we learn that all around the world. I was in Puerto Rico recently after the hurricane, and I was visiting some of the uh, tough favelas, and there were schools in public housing areas where no children had even sent to graduate because their families actually worked in the drug industry as opposed to having to work hard and get a job and work through a process. Mm. So it's fundamental in terms of society and community, educate to job, to sense of self, to sense of community. Mm. Um, but we see it in different dimensions around the world. Oh, well, another angle to that, though, is who's going to rebuild these countries if the children are not educated? Mm. You, you can't just keep throwing money in and donations and aid. Someone's actually got to do the work, and it's much better if it's done locally and not by shipped in foreign workers. So uh, a localist, avoid a vacuum. When there is a vacuum, fill it quickly, fill it in a constructive, locally inspired way, and and rely on community and support and enable community to do the right thing. Yes, and use communications that resonate locally. So I don't think leaflet drops work, but I do have a special place for poetry in my work because I've discovered that it's incredibly good at resonating at a local level, at least in Yemen. And I think that's the point, isn't it? All communication has to be intimate, therefore it has to be local. Yes. Um, and we have to get to the purest level of the local connection. So uh, poetry, you were saying poetry, how it's sort of important in the community in Yemen and how it's also part of jihadist propaganda. It is. It's been a much overlooked part of jihadist propaganda. My data set from Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula shows that 20% of their output contains poetry. It's not there for fun. It's not there as a space filler. It uh, actually has a role Can to play. Can you imagine if a Western government, 20% of their communication was poetry? <laughs> right? Or well, contained yeah, poetry. Well, wouldn't right. that be a wonderful thing? <laughs> I think we might see some improvements. That would be a great idea. But, uh, of course, the reason it's overlooked is that we don't put any value on that kind of communication because we're always looking at things from our own perspective and not from the perspective of how locals would value that. I did some survey work uh, before the war in about 2012, 2013, and discovered amongst a battery of uh, much more obviously relevant questions that 74% of my very large sample of tribesmen and tribeswomen in the east of Yemen thought poetry was very important or important in their daily lives. That's on a scale of five. So it just shows you. Wow. It's still a very resonant way of communicating with local communities. So it really inspires us to make sure that we truly understand the local dynamic, the communication framework, the structure of families and communities, how they learn, how they communicate, and how we can influence them. Right, summed so, up brilliantly. <laughs> well, gosh, I really appreciate you coming and uh, and sharing your story with us, and hopefully, you can inspire colleagues and communities as uh, as they take these learnings and apply them in different jobs. Let's hope so. So, with that, Dr. Liz, thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Welcome. Thank it. you. <laughs>